So now that we've looked at the five lies that Jesus actually took the time to warn us about and gave us the key to combat, let's recap. One, God is not punishing you because you've done something wrong. Two, God is not punishing you because you are something wrong or there's something wrong with you. Three, lies of the unknown and or the future. Four, lies of the pain and problems of the world. Five, lies that God won't keep his word. These lies can be diabolical in how they manifest to Christians and atheists alike. So the next step in analyzing these things is to seek out independent confirmation. Let's look at the first two specifically, and to verify them, we have to look no farther than the notorious book of Job. Job, as a book in the Bible, is something of an anomaly. Did it happen before or after the flood? When and where exactly did it take place? Is it even a real event or a parable? Did you know it's the oldest book of the Bible, when it was written, not when it takes place? Briefly, Job is a story of an interaction between God and his most upright person on earth. The book is generally broken into four parts. The first section, the first four chapters, is the part most people are familiar with. It recounts the context of the bet between God and the Satan. Most Christians I've seen preach on this part tend to use it as an insight into the character of Satan, and a few will even take a jab at Job's wife due to her comment at the side of the graves of her children when she turns to her husband and says essentially, why aren't you blaming God for this? As Charles Swindle says in his treatise on the life of Job, it's a common point of teaching and it is really not fair or right to pick on Job's wife for this. I challenge any modern Christian to stand by and watch as your wealthy and powerful spouse loses everything, culminating in the death of all your children and not having the same feelings as Job's wife. Not to excuse the actual statement, but if God is the God I think he is, he would certainly be understanding if nothing else. In fact, as we continue on these videos, I'm going to tell you exactly what I propose God feels about this and show you the evidence to back it up. In this case, the first four chapters of Job are merely context to the true message of this book. The second part is the part that I'm going to focus most of this video on. This is chapters 4 through 37. These are the dreaded inner passages where Job's friends come to comfort but end up exhorting him incorrectly. We know it's incorrect because God actually says that they blaspheme. This is found in the last fourth part of the book and consists of just the last chapter. It's the epilogue or something, merely filling us in on what happened after their encounter with God. The third part is the famous God the Zookeeper section. Most of the time when I hear someone preach on this section, it's very positive and easy. We get a good look from God himself about the love and wonder that God obviously has about the beauty and elegance of this world he created. He talks in a way that is clearly not exhorting Job in the common sense, but it's an amazing addition to the Bible. Just God going through and saying, see all this? It's so complicated, but I've got my hand on it all. That's a very important and comforting message from God. He's got his hand on it all, including you and me and the worst problems and enemies you've got. He's got it all under control. I personally enjoy that third section where God is talking about the world and the sparrows and the trees, etc. It lines up with one of the best dissertations of spiritual warfare in the past 200 years written by G. Campbell Morgan entitled The Problems of the Religious Life, the Opposing Forces of the Religious Life. In this sermon, he talks about how the sinful world ruled by Satan completely changes once one comes to Christ and is able to view the world as a wonder created just for you. Then in the last section, we come to an interesting line that, if considered with the rest of the text, I believe is the key to understanding the entire book. And that's Job 42, verse 7. And it came to pass after the Lord had spoken all these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Tamanite, Thou hast sinned and thy two friends, for ye have not said anything true before me, as my servant Job hath. Get that? What these three said and did was blasphemous to God. What Job said and did was not. It's actually kind of rare for God to speak so clearly to us about his character that when I find little things like this that can change the entire viewpoint, if it's taken into account, I pay attention. In this case, God is clearly and directly letting us know that the arguments of Job's friends were bad. That's the message. That's what I'm talking about today. So let's take a close look at just what it is that these three said. We'll start with Eliphaz. Eliphaz, whom I'll call El from now on, is what we'd call an elder statesman. He's really good with the spiritual learning, but it takes a lot to convince him otherwise. He knew what the problem was because he had had a vision he claimed was from God that showed him that sinfulness was universal in man. 
man. We don't know what really happened. It's possible he made it up like a parable. It's possible it was different than what he said. All we know is El's own description of it as written in Job. El states that a spirit moved over him and then he heard a voice. The voice at first sounds very similar to that third part of Job where God's talking about the world and the trees and the hippos, but I suspect that's only because the entire book of Job is written like it is a poem. That first speech of El is two chapters long, chapters four and five. It's not clear where the vision ends and El's exhortation begins. He then tries to convince Job that he must be being punished due to his sin and to repent to God. Now remember, God himself says in the beginning of Job that Job is the most upright and righteous man. That's what sets Satan off in the first place. So this is classic common exhortation and rebuke. Of course, since he's an elder statesman, he's not being too aggressive. It feels like he's being gentle with his friend Job, but this is the opening shot. And then Job answers him in the next two chapters, chapters 6 and 7, and he starts off by telling El that he wishes that was the problem and knows that's not the case. Then Job kind of shoots back at El with some jabs about what kind of friend would come when he's in mourning and say such things. Finally, in chapter 7, 13 to 9, Job is saying that living the way El is describing is tantamount to death or a living death. He tells his friend, why would you tell me this stuff while I'm suffering? Are you trying to get me to blame God or to feel worse? I don't know about you, but I personally have had people say things like that to me. That may seem odd, but that's exactly what I'm talking about in all these videos. God does not want us to live in fear. He is not the author of fear. Moreover, and this is my own interjection, but that's a lot like having a quid pro quo God. That's a lot like saying, just give praise to God to get something, which is the opposite of grace. It's witchcraft. It's treating God like a spiritual Coke machine where you put in some spiritual quarters and get out a spiritual prize. Some may be shocked by my saying that. The truth is that Christianity is different from all other world religions and always has been because of this point. It's not about how we treat God, it's about how we treat each other. The problem is that today we are told that Christianity is equally valid as the other buffet table choices of spirituality. It's not, we operate under grace. By destroying grace and application, even if not in definition, this is where we are today. So each of the three friends then go back and forth like this with Job eight more times, not counting Elihu, and they are about the same, so I'm not going to go too deep into them. But let's take a look at the rest of these interactions briefly. Next up is Bildad the Shuite. Bildad, who I'll call Bill from now on, is a sage who looks to tradition for his authority. He starts off by correcting Job's previous comments by telling Job he is all talk. He actually says, how long wilt thou speak these things, and how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? He then goes on in this vein for the entire chapter, his objections mirroring the same sentiment as El, basically trying to get through to Job that he should heed the advice of El. Job then answers him, beginning in chapter 9, with similar statements to those he gave to El, basically agreeing that God is great, and then says, even if I could criticize God, I would not have to be nuts to do it now when I'm suffering. The worse off we are, the less we want to offend God. That sounds pretty reasonable to me. I can find many places in my life where I felt exactly the same way. But note the verses. He continues with a similar style rebuttal, addressing the criticism of the bill and continuing to reinforce who was he to challenge God? How would one even do that? And he certainly wasn't going to do it in a way that is critical of God since God is not punishing him for his sins. There must be another reason. And we know that this is true because the first part of Job clearly shows it's all a bet between God and Satan. I need to point out that God does want us to cry out to him when we're suffering. I believe when Job said that he didn't want to, he was saying it in the context of, if only there was someone between me and God, and this is credited by some to be prophetic of the coming of Jesus. So even if Job challenged God, he would then be guilty. Again, Job reiterates he wishes there was an intermediary or intercessor who would then bring it to God. Then in verses 22 to 24, Job explains the truth of it. Who God destroys or blesses is not a metric of who's good or not. God has his own ways, and regardless of our temporal opinion of whether it's good or bad, his ways always work out for his good. This is good news for us, and God does love us, even while we're sinners. And probably the most pervasive mistake most Christians I've met make when they talk about not judging. The only time in the Bible that not judging is a thing is when it's concerning who's favored or forgiven or saved by God, and especially to what degree. And then at this point, if you're following on in the Bible, I need to point out that many versions, including the NIV, make it sound like Job is saying all these things about God, that God is punishing him, etc. 
That's one reason I tend to stick with the King James. If you read the King James, it's a lot clearer that Job is saying his friends are punishing him. Finally, Job sums up by saying again that there is no way to compromise or even get a fair hearing unless there is some kind of intercessor another prophetic reference to Jesus. Clearly, Job is concerned with how others judge him because they're wrong but think they're right. God backs him up on this later, which at first glance seems to be Job saying that God is taking a rod to him, and a lot of people just go with that. But I believe what he's really saying here is, of course God is great, but he's God, and I'm just a man, no matter how upright or how sinful I may be. But because he is so great, and there's no one that can mediate between us, and I'm just a man, I'm in no position to argue. Sort of like not arguing with your boss because you aren't seeing the big picture he sees. None of that means Job believes he's being punished. It's just a sane response to coming face to face with someone so cosmically powerful. Next comes Zophar, who I'll call Zoe from now on. Now Zoe appears to be a little more hot-headed and angry compared to the other two. His statements are more brutal and direct compared to the others. He opens up rather viciously in the first six verses by saying that Job is just talking a lot of words without meaning. That if only God could talk, he would tell you we are right. That if God told you true wisdom, it would be more than you could even dream of. And then Zoe actually tells Job that as far as Zoe is concerned, all the loss and death and illness Job is suffering is far less than Job obviously deserves. What a friend. But isn't this how many people carry out their exhortations? Job's response also changes in character as he's answering Zoe, basically starting with, you guys are so smart, without you there would be no wisdom. You think that highly of yourselves. I know how God is great and so far above us, but you can't deny that the tabernacle of robbers do prosper sometimes, just like the righteous man also suffers. So then this continues rotating through three friends we have just discussed, and it's mostly similar to the ones we've seen already. All I'm trying to demonstrate is that you should read it yourself. The founder of the Protestant religion, Martin Luther, went through hell to give us access and tools to read the Bible for ourselves, and it's pretty amazing when you do. Most, most theologians, professional or lay, will agree that Job's three friends are espousing a slightly twisted version of God. I agree with this. Another point they will make is that Job also is offering insult to God, primarily by bringing up such verses as Job saying, Would that I have never been born. I don't agree with this one. We see God saying that Job did not sin against God with his mouth in the last four sections. This surprises me then that you can find this incorrect interpretation all over the internet. What I've noticed is that they are all referring to more recent versions of the Bible, including the message version. I would like to note that you can find just as many people presenting evidence that these later versions have been subtly twisted from the original word as you can find people presenting evidence it hasn't. It depends if you think the changes from understanding we have gained since the King James came out are valid or not. It's equally valid to say that these changes and the time between can be attributed to a better understanding of things, which we didn't know the last 200 years, or that these changes represent the last few hundred years as a result of a conspiracy to silence the word of God. Take your pick. I've got mountains of evidence that say it just might be twisted, and I'm going to share it with you. But one thing that bothers me is that the third section where God is covering a review of his creation is somehow a rebuke of Job. This is where I have to object. I believe this belief is exactly the same message Job's friends are using. The truth of this error is found in the book of Job itself in chapter 42, verse 7. He says, And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. The actual words of God. Job spoke the thing that was right with God. So then when God starts talking in the third part, is it a rebuke? I don't think so. And this is where I get what I think is the true message of Job. The only way someone can take all that part as not a rebuke is to view it in the context of supporting or confirming what Job has been saying in the conversation with his friends. Let me reiterate. When God starts the verse 38 with chapter 38, verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? The answer is, my friends did. Then God says, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? What he's doing is he's explaining what his final judgment is going to be. 
Keep in mind that this is poetry, and everything God is saying here is a mirror of the arguments Job's friends made. This is how we talk with our friends. We correct what someone says to a third person. We tell our friends so-and-so was wrong when they said X. When El says about his vision in chapter 4, verse 19, how much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth, he's using the same words as when God answers in 38, verse 4, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Job's friends talk about who controls the rain, and God tells Job, I do, in 38, 8 through 9, and on and on. Even if it clearly says God answered Job in this section, this interpretation would still apply. If Job's friends didn't hear God talking during this part, then he's still explaining to Job the error of his friends. But I do think they heard the God in the whirlwind. The idea that God is rebuking Job only makes sense if we invalidate the entire message that God built all this for us. I take chapter 38 as clear love. Where were you when I made all this? God really doesn't need us. So why does God do all this? Why create the universe? Why manage all the birds and clouds and stars and everything else? I used to be an avid scuba diver and instructor. I was lucky enough to dive all over this world. One time, my grandmother told me, as I was showing her photos from my undersea adventures, why would God make all these fish so colorful and beautiful if they were to be hidden from sight? Why indeed? Why make trees and other beauty at all? Why go through the entire redemption and do so for the entire field just to get the treasure out of it? I believe the point of this is simple. Everything God did, does, and will do is out of love for us. One way or the other, whether you believe he created man to replace the third of heaven that fell or not, he clearly cares. I'm not sure he cannot care. Time and again, he says, I have heard my people cry out in suffering, and then he does something about it. Why? This is cause for you and I to rejoice. It is so hard to find love here on earth, even more now than in previous generations, but the very creator of the universe who has placed his hand on us throughout history and has a plan yet to come isn't doing it for fun. It's not a game. It's really not a competition. He has no competition, so why? The only answer is that he loves us, his children, his creations, and that is good news. I started this paper hoping to show that the lies of the enemy are that if we are suffering or not feeling very blessed in, for any reason at any given moment, that it's a lie. I think Job supports that point very well. Unfortunately, nowadays, there are many churches that still preach this directly or indirectly, and even more Christians have a hard time completely accepting this. As we go into the hardest times in the history of the U.S., this message is more important than ever. My relationships, my finances, my living conditions, etc., are taking a beating. At the time I'm writing this, I'm actually homeless and unemployed. Some will use these facts to say my message can't be right because God would have protected me or taken care of me. All love ends in abandonment. People change, they leave, or they die. But God's love is everlasting. He will never abandon us. Just like Job, at the point of his greatest loss and pain, God didn't abandon him. And if he didn't love Job's friends, he wouldn't have given them a way out. Why bother? Many more of us will go through loss and pain this upcoming year, and so I beg all of you in America or Ukraine or Gaza to remember this message. When you have the thought that God is punishing you, when politicians actually say on the news again that God is punishing you, or when you have to tighten your belt and your kids can't have what you want for them for whatever reason, or when you worked your entire life and your retirement funds are made worthless, or you have to retire as a pauper, remember God is not punishing you for something you did wrong. God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient. It's such a massive unmerited gift that in comparison to any and all troubles you may be experiencing, they pale in comparison. It's such an incredible gift that my contentment can exceed my circumstance. All of our suffering only exists in our subjectivity, and I know that a bruised reed shall not break. We judge our circumstances and we decide what is suffering or not. We don't get to decide what we get from God as if we might know the right confession, the right good deeds to perform, or the right prayers to make. That's witchcraft, honestly. I'm saying the right words to get what I want from the supernatural. As C.S. Lewis explained, anything we can give God, any virtue or works at all, is like a kid who asks his father for money to buy him a Father's Day gift. I take great comfort in that. All my righteousness is as filthy rags. Any virtue or good deeds I may accomplish would be impossible without God making it possible. Therefore, every single thing God has done or is doing is a gift. Thank you, Lord, for my life and all the lives you put in it. That's all that needs to be said. It's all I can say. 
The fact I'm breathing is the greatest gift of the universe and it was given freely. Anything else is apistos, the opposite of faith. Next, let's go to the New Testament and see the same message in Galatians. 